So now we've addressed the ideas of health-related fitness, we're going to move on to this concept of school-related fitness. And let me kind of make a bit of a confession. I am still a little unsure exactly why this group of components of fitness are called school-related and the others health-related. I've, I've read about it in numerous uh, places, and I still haven't found a convincing argument other than just practical reasons of splitting them up as to why they're separated into these groups. If someone else can enlighten me, teachers out there, students out there, then I'm somewhat intrigued. But anyway, that's where we are. So school-related components of fitness. The first one we are going to address is the concept of power. And as always with this we've got the definition here we've got the ability to use strength quickly so the first thing i want to address here is it immediately reminds me of what we've spoken about before which is the concept of elastic strength so i would encourage you very much so to consider that power and elastic strength are very synonymous or similar concepts i'm not claiming they are the same thing but they overlap greatly in how we train and develop them also overlap and test them overlaps greatly the other point I would make, and I think this is um, a really intriguing thing, is that we have to we have to sort of say, well, first of all, then, if we're going to take the concept of power, the first thing we can do is we can say that effectively power is strength multiplied by speed. So obviously those notions of static strength are not relevant here. Dynamic and and elastic strength are highly relevant but we're talking about how much force strength can be applied at high rates of movement and one of the intriguing things i find about that is if you look at almost all um, uh, images and concepts of modern westernized sport it's based on a principle of, of power now yes we have our endurance and aerobic type activities but there's an awful lot of sport which is based on the concept of power and i personally think Going off on a big tangent here, by the way, I personally think that this reflects on the idea that sport was really, that the, the modern concept of sport was developed in the image of masculinity and manliness. So, of course, what came out of that process in those public schools in the 19th century? Well, it was this power-based type performance. Interesting kind of philosophical point. Anyway, I'm going to stop banging on about it. Now, how do we measure power? Well, first of all, we have our units, which are watts. Be aware of that. How do we test it? We test through tests such as the vertical jump test, the vertical jump test. And you can also talk about the standing um, broad jump as well. But we also have our Margaria Kalman test, which we've already had a look at. If you don't recall what that is, I recommend you go and have a look at our uh, tutorials on that. And of course, we also have our Wingate test. Remember, with Wingate, we're talking about a test where... Um, Effectively, we cycle as powerfully as possible for 30 seconds and we look at peak um, power and we also have a look at um, power reduction. So it's kind of an interesting test. Let's move on to reaction time. Reaction time, again, central to many notions of modern sport. The time taken to initiate or simply start a response to a stimulus. So it's how. It, so first of all, reaction time is a period of time. Let's get that clear. And our objective, typically in sport, is to reduce that time period. Okay. So let's let's make that as our first point. First of all, with reaction time, we are going to aim to reduce reaction time. A better performance is that we reduce reaction time. The other point, and I think this just gets into really fascinating concepts of sport and sports sciences. I would describe uh, reaction time as a very specific concept. You might yourself or, or, or someone else you know be sort of a very kind of highly reactive, very quick reacting performer. But I will hazard a guess that that is in specific format. So what would be a good example? If we take, if we were to take um, uh, someone like a table tennis player who might be able to respond very, very quickly and react very, very quickly to a smash in table tennis, and we put them in front of a very, very, very high quality tennis player serving at them, even though in theory their reactions are very good to a ball coming towards them, they're going to find it very difficult to react in time to that tennis ball because they're not encoded they don't have the programming to respond to those specific stimuli okay so i'm saying this stimuli are often the specific thing so it's an interesting point and the other point is that the stimulus can be visual or it can be oral and i would go further and say it can also be kinesthetic as well or movement based but anyway we'll, we'll come back to that in in future studies let's have a look at the concept of agility again central to the effective performance in a whole range of modern sports agility the ability that enables a person to quickly change body position so like change of direction done precisely in a precise manner so again for me really the definition kind of does it all for us a couple of things I would reference for you the Illinois Agility Test. 
I mean, I'm sure you've had a go at this. If you haven't, I'd recommend it to you. There are other agility tests as well, um, but this is one that generally gets used broadly. Illinois, make that a proper eye. The Illinois agility test I would recommend um, that you have a look at. And the other point I'd make is that agility is really central to games. Okay, so if you're playing games, any kind of uh, net wall invasion game type activity, agility is absolutely pivotal. And often what we find is exciting to watch within those sports, let's take hockey or rugby or football, is this very high agility level. It's very spectacular. It's very aesthetically pleasing to see rapid dodges, change of direction, power moves, this kind of thing. Coordination, again, you know, an absolutely central concept to the effective performance um, of not only fitness but skill the ability to perform a smooth and accurate motor task often involving the senses so i want to take the senses point first of all coordination very often not always involves a sense of perception or what we might call processing so on other parts of PE studies, you might look at basic information processing, for example. Well, of course, coordination or the production of a motor task, simply what we mean a movement by that, involves the processing of information to produce the right movement. So how would we test it? We have this rather, I mean, I've always felt we need a different test for this, but we've got this wall toss test that you can have a go. I'm sure you have already. And I'm going to say as well that coordination, this is an important statement, I think, is central to all technique. Okay, so we can't really hold effective technique unless we have a good level of coordination. And finally, coordination is often what we refer to as multi limb. And what we mean by this, this is not just the idea of I don't know, striking the tennis serve with the hitting arm, it's also about timing and getting the correct technique of tossing the ball and moving the feet into the correct positions, also. So it's often a multi limb, limb, not ling, coordination. Finally, balance, the ability to retain center of mass over base of support. So when, with your definitions, make sure you can be very specific with those definitions. It's not enough just to go, well, balance, it's like balancing, in it, you know? No, we're talking about center of mass, often for a human being around, about the navel being above the base for support. Now, the base of support is a very interesting concept because... Often, to be more stable, can we make the base of support bigger? When we look at aesthetic movements like in dance or gymnastic, the, the impressive stuff is making the base of support smaller or seemingly positioning the center of mass away from the base of support. This is where the kind of the, often the beauty of things comes from. Now, <clears throat> we also we also want to think about this in um, in the concept of kind of how we know whether we're in balance. So it's often based on a principle of awareness. Now, we're going to call this kinesthetic awareness later when we study this. But of course, you know you're in balance because you don't have that kind of wobbling, falling over feeling. And that is based on awareness. You know, wh wherever you are now, sitting, standing, do you feel balance in your position? If you lean, watch well, you don't fall over, obviously, if you lean over to the right and go right onto the edge of your chair or whatever, can you find a point where you just become unbalanced and are you aware of that? And that's what we're referring to. Um, secondly, we also have different types of balancing. We have static balancing, which is a balance where you literally hold it like in gymnastics or something like that. But we also, a bit like our strength, we have the notion of dynamic balance. This is remaining in balance during a movement. So, a, a, I don't know, a footballer being really balanced as she dodges around with high agility around her opponent, for example, remaining in that balanced position. And finally, how do we test this? We have what we refer to as the stalk test which we've talked about previously, or we have the beam test. And again, if you haven't looked at those, and we cover those in our tutorials for you, but go and have a look at those and make sure you understand what those are. They're very, very simple testing methodologies, but you just need to be able to um, simply define and describe the, the, the protocols for each. Have a good one.